Welcome back to the Law Crime Network. My name is Bob Bianchi, and I'll be taking it from 12 to 3. Uh, let me bring, do it right now. I'm going to bring on my great guest, uh, Sanford Rubenstein. has been in before. Uh, he's a law and crime stalwart here, a uh, great supporter of the network, gives excellent commentary. And if you haven't ever seen anything about Sanford, you need to go on his website, head handling all the huge cases in New York City. Welcome to the show, Sanford. Nice to be here again. All right, awesome. Uh, another thing that we got on the plate, Sanford, is this Robert Durst. I mean, I know you've been following this guy for a long time time like we all have and the case just keeps getting kookier and kookier he's kookier and kookier and there was a court appearance yesterday and the prosecution was making arguments because this case is speedballing to trial murder charge let's take a look all right, so Sanford there, just so our audience understands, prosecution's making an argument about this lying in wait. The defense is trying to get this, like, knocked out so that they're not going to be able to use it. So let's go to the last point first, which is where the judge is, is basically saying, so in other words, you're trying to prove lying in wait through circumstantial evidence as opposed to necessarily direct evidence. Can you explain to our, as I say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, our audience here, um, what is meant by that, by the connection of those dots and circumstantial as opposed to direct? Well, clearly, the ultimate objective objective here of the defense is to not allow into evidence the testimony that, well not testimony, what he said on that TV show, mm -hmm. which was aired, uh, actually it wasn't even aired, it was something that he mentioned uh, sort of as an aside, almost a confession with regard to killing three people. And the issue is, was the uh, TV show an agent of the prosecutor, so to speak. That's the guts of where they're going ultimately with this pretrial hearing. So, so the real question is what impact does that have on either allowing or not allowing into evidence the statement that he made that the defense is trying to make less important by making the producers of the show an agent of the prosecutors, which I really don't see. Right. Yeah. To the point, though, that the judge was referring to and the difference between direct and circumstantial evidence is that uh, in addition to the statement that he made in, in the Jinx uh, documentary, which is part of the argument, the, the prosecution also ticked off that uh, Suman Berman uh, was in the rear of the house, not in the front of the house, that there was no forced break in, that he they had that kind of relationship where she would allow um, him to come in, that it was done execution style, that there was a habit and custom evidence where the dogs are normally separated and have to be taken care of, and that was done. In other words, this was a trusted person that came into the home, in addition to the confession that you just mentioned to, and the cadaver note, uh, which is, is an interesting piece that maybe we'll get into a little bit later, but where Beverly is spelled wrong on both the note that the perpetrator was teasing the police with as well supposedly a sample that of a Durst letter where he used Beverly and spelled that wrong as well and they're basically saying that all those little pieces of evidence taken together circumstantially show that Durst was lying in wait no well clearly it's a matter of circumstantial evidence versus direct and I think that was the question you asked me initially and that is what's the difference well circumstantial evidence is not specific statements with regard to something that happened or something that someone saw it's evidence of the circumstance, which would be statements that he made on the TV show, uh, the fact that she trusted him. All of these factors combine to try to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Have you had an opportunity to listen to the statement that he made? In, now, just so our audience understands this, too. While he's taping, he actually goes mic'd, and the mic is hot, into the bathroom and makes statements to the effect of, well, now they got me. Uh, yeah, that's right. I killed them all. Yeah, Something to that yeah, effect. That Have was you exactly, listened to it? That was exactly the statement. And he's almost mumbling to himself. I don't know how the defense is going to try to explain that away to a jury because they're going to have to if it gets into evidence and I think it will. Uh, okay, well we're, we're going to look at one more clip, but there's something about that statement that he's such a kooky guy. I I'm wondering, I'm fearful as a prosecutor, can I really prove what he meant by that? Was it tongue-in-cheek? Was it that he was agitated? Because he's such a squirrely individual. So uh, many, I think, most believe that that statement is very, very damning and detrimental and certainly the prosecution is going to use that as a major piece of evidence. Let's take a look at one What'll more clip. What'll be real interesting will be how they try to explain that away. Right, right. Yep. Yeah. Let's take one more look at a clip from yesterday's hearing. Uh, well, I'll tell you one thing, Sanford. I think this prosecutor really knows how to put a case together. He certainly knows his and facts. And I think, if anything, this is a lesson for defendants. Don't do media. Yeah, and, it, you know, it, he had... What precipitated this whole jinx thing was that there was another documentary about him, but then he wanted to have this jinx documentary done. And you know, and I know, as any good attorney, you don't go in and basically splay yourself out there to a bunch of producers knowing the cops are going to be watching every word you say because you're a suspect. Now, the prosecution was pointing out uh, the victim in this case was a good friend of his, uh, Susan Berman, and she, it's believed, knew about the information of Robert Durst having killed his wife, 
which had been unsolved for many, many years. And law enforcement started to pick this case back up again. I believe actually the New York authorities, if I'm not mistaken, maybe in Westchester County. And Susan Berman was going to be speaking to them. And that is the motive. And what the prosecutor said I thought was really good. Horrendous, yes, but not crazy. He's covering in his tracks. And that he wrote that note because she was Jewish and he wanted her to have a proper burial and because he had to do it, not because he wanted to do it. What do you think about that argument? Well, I think that, once again, the fact that he's doing this media is so possibly destructive to him, as this trial will represent, that, that he, he never should have done it. And then he's making statements that are going to be used against them on trial. Uh, very, very, uh, I'm sure against the advice of his lawyer. I can't believe a defense lawyer would say, yeah, go on TV and do another show to try to rebut a documentary that you know, like that was done about you. By the way, it was Janine Pirro, the DA that's in Westchester thought, County, yeah. who opened the case up again. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's what precipitated this whole cascading set of things. And let's not forget the other case. He had been on trial for murder before for killing, I believe his, his name was Morris Black down south when he was uh, pretending to be a elderly woman who was mute. Well, that was to try to get out of it. But what he did was he dismembered the body. He admitted that. Right. But, but he said, I didn't kill him. I just dismembered the right. body. Right, self-defense. And he was acquitted. And he was acquitted. He was acquitted. He was acquitted. So this guy has had uh, some storied life. And then, of course, they find him in Louisiana with a, it, this is during the, the course of the whole Susan Berman investigation with a gun, a, a, a fake mask, and a, a thousands and thousands of dollars of cash. I mean, this guy, um, it's, it's kind of a strange, sophisticated, I mean, he knows what he's doing. He knows how to cover his tracks. Well, he got acquitted once, whether mm -hmm. he was guilty or not, uh, we'll never know, but they couldn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt uh, the charges against him in that case. But what he's doing here, it's almost like he's he's taunting the prosecutors. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll, I'll notes, uh, statements on, on uh, uh, a mic that he didn't realize was on, but maybe he did know it was on. Who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, he's taunting the prosecutors almost. Right. Okay. Well, listen, Sanford Rubenstein, thank you so much for that. This case, Robert Durst, he is just fascinating to watch. If you haven't had an opportunity to look at it before, certainly we're going to be covering the trial here at the Law and Crime Network, Gavel to Gavel. You can be assured of that. we got to do a little business, but we'll be back with more Law and Crime. Stay with us.